And while we're still in West Asia, let's talk about a country that has hit the gold mine, and quite literally so. Iran has just hit the white gold mine. Lithium is called white gold, and not without good reason. The metal will drive the world in the future. Batteries needed for a variety of electronics run on lithium. And lithium is a critical element in electric vehicles. And if Iran's discovery of lithium is true, it will make the country the world's second largest holder of lithium reserves, which could radically change Tehran's fortunes and force the world to rethink its relationship with the country. This is the same Iran that is amongst the most sanctioned countries in the world. Lithium could be its way out. Our next report tells you more. Lithium, it's all around you. In your smartphones, laptops, headphones, and just about any battery-driven device. It's also in cars. Batteries used in electric vehicles are made of lithium. As the world tries to wean itself off fossil fuels, lithium has become an extremely important element. For countries that have lithium deposits, it's a prized possession that makes them matter. And Iran is the latest country to hit the lithium jackpot. On Saturday, Iran announced the discovery of large lithium deposits in the western province of Hamadan. Iran's Minister for Industry, Mines and Trade said, for the first time in Iran, a lithium reserve has been discovered in Hamadan. He also gave a rough figure. Iran estimates that it now has 8.5 million tons of lithium. That accounts for the world's second largest lithium reserves after Chile. Chile holds 9.2 million tons of lithium reserves. That also makes Iran the country that holds a tenth of the world's lithium reserves. Before Iran, India was the country that got lucky with lithium. Last month, India discovered close to 5.9 million tons of lithium reserves in Jammu and Kashmir. The discovery of the light metal has the potential to propel India's electric vehicle and electronic sectors. But for Iran, the discovery of lithium means a lot more. It could change the way the world looks at Iran. Presently, Iran is reeling under the stress of economic sanctions. Its economy is in a bad shape, its currency even worse. The rial has lost 30% of its value against the US dollar in the last two months. Inflation in Iran is hovering around the 50% mark. Iranians are now finding it difficult to buy meat. It's now out of their reach. Poverty has risen, especially in Iran's rural areas. This is happening to a country that is one of the world's largest producers of oil and gas. But international sanctions make it extremely difficult for Iran to export its fuel. That means there's not much revenue coming in, resulting in economic misery. And the people are losing their patience. There is a limit to our patience. We can tolerate difficulties to a certain limit. When we are past that limit, people stop and ask, what are we supposed to do? Maybe dollar rate reaches one million rials. How are we supposed to live? How far this thing is going to go? Until when? The lithium discovery could be a lifesaver for Iran. Lithium is an expensive metal and its demand is expected to rise. If Iran manages to become an exporter of lithium, and that's a big if, its economic woes could be significantly mitigated. The West would have to walk back on its harsh sanctions on Iran to import its lithium. And even if it doesn't, the world is just so much wider than the West. What's to say there won't be countries willing to bypass sanctions and buy lithium from Iran? China most certainly will. China is among the biggest importers of lithium, and its ties with Iran are flourishing. Iran might have just found a key to escape its economic crisis. Will it know how to use it, though? Only time will tell. And talking about wars, China seems to be gearing up for one. It's not what you think. This is about China's internal challenges. Beijing is dealing with a long list of problems, a struggling economy, a hostile environment overseas, and a credibility crisis, which is an old problem, really. But maybe they've begun to see it themselves now. So the question is, how will China deal with these issues? Xi Jinping is doing what bad managers do. You don't take blame for the problems. You don't give freedom to your team to fix the problems. You just change the team. That's what the Chinese president is doing, appointing a new team. And this is a group of trusted lieutenants, needless to say, all men. I mean, look at their CCP meetings and tell me if you can spot a woman. 
But that's a discussion for another day, perhaps. For now, Xi Jinping is appointing an all-new, all-male crack team. And their task is cut out. We'll start with the number two, the position of the premier, the second most powerful man in China after Xi Jinping. Currently, it's Li Keqiang. And now he's making way for another Li, Li Qiang. He'll be the new premier of China. Li Qiang has known Xi Jinping for almost two decades. They worked together before. This was in the province of Zhejiang. Xi Jinping served as a party boss there. And when he took the top job as Chinese president, he made Li Qiang the governor of Zhejiang. His last assignment was in Shanghai. Li Qiang was the Communist Party chief there in Shanghai. He oversaw last year's draconian lockdown. 25 million people were locked up in their homes for two months in Shanghai. There was a major backlash, an angry backlash against this policy. But it seems to have won him more brownie points in Beijing. After all, he's getting a promotion now. Li will be the new premier of China. His key responsibility will be to manage the Chinese economy and, if possible, to revive it. It won't be easy. We wish him luck. Next on the team is Zhao Leji. He will be the number three. His role, China's chief lawmaker. The responsibilities include turning Xi Jinping's political vision into specific laws. Then we have Wang Huning. He will oversee two areas, ethnic and religious affairs, and Taiwan. <laughs> Ding Suxiang is the new executive vice premier of China. He was Xi Jinping's chief of staff. He will have oversight over government affairs, and he'll implement economic and industrial policy. He Le Fang will be serving as the vice premier. He will oversee economic, finance, and trade policies. General He Weidong will be the military man in Xi Jinping's team. He's set to serve as a state councillor. He used to lead the PLA's Eastern Theatre Command, the one that is the closest to Taiwan, and that explains his presence in the top seven. In fact, there's a special emphasis on Taiwan in this reshuffle. Xi Jinping's new foreign minister made that clear today. His name is Ching Gang. He was in New Delhi a few days back. You might remember that. Today, he's in Beijing. Ching did a press conference. When asked about Taiwan, guess how he them, responded? Uh, he pulled out a copy of the Constitution of China and tried to prove that Taiwan belongs to Beijing. To answer your question, let me first quote two sentences from the preamble of the Constitution of the People's Republic of China. Taiwan is a part of the sacred territory of the People's Republic of China. It is the sacred duty of all the Chinese people, including our fellow Chinese in Taiwan, to achieve the great reunification of the motherland. Chin is conveying a clear message here. China's muscular foreign policy is set to continue, and she is leading from the front, in taking on America at least. The Chinese president said that Washington is trying to suppress Beijing. Allow me to quote from what he said. And this is Xi Jinping. He says, Western countries led by the U.S. have implemented all-round containment, encirclement, and suppression against us, bringing unprecedentedly severe challenges to our country's development. That's what he said, the Chinese president. He's playing the victim here, but he's not the victim. His appointments convey what many already know. The Chinese president today is stronger than ever before. There are no potential successors in his inner circle. In fact, this is a group of yes-men. Their positions are tied to their loyalty to Xi Jinping. They will not challenge him. Xi Jinping's epic power grab is now complete. We now shift our focus to Turkey, a country that was battered by massive earthquakes last month. It is now gearing up for an election, an election that could potentially shift the political tectonic plates too. Let me explain. Elections in Turkey are due in the month of May, and President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's political future is on the line. How? He's losing popularity rather quickly. Inflation under his watch is over 50%. The earthquakes ravaged areas which are his traditional strongholds. His government's response is being seen as poor, and the construction boom was seen as his big achievement. It is now being blamed for the devastation. So the upcoming election is a litmus test for him, perhaps the toughest of his career. And now he has a challenger from the opposition. It is this man, Kemal Kilic Darolu. 
the official presidential candidate of the opposition in Turkey. And remember, the opposition is an alliance. It is called the Table of Six, a rather shaky table. We'll tell you more about it in a bit. But first, listen in to what the Turkish opposition had to say. I consider it a duty to announce the decision we have taken following our meetings. We name Mr. Kemal Kirigalu as a presidential candidate. Our table is the table of peace and brotherhood. Our biggest goal is to carry Turkey towards prosperous, peaceful and joyful days. We will govern Turkey through consultation and consensus. So who is Kemal Kilic Darolu? For starters, he heads the largest opposition party in Turkey, the Republican People's Party or CHP. Kilic Darolu was born in Turkey's Tunceli province, the same province that has witnessed many violent rebellions in the past, but this man calls himself a quiet force. His colleagues have gone one step forward. They call him Turkey's Gandhi, a reference to one of India's greatest icons, Mahatma Gandhi. But why the comparison? Kilic Darolu's colleagues say he is soft-spoken like Mahatma Gandhi and to a certain degree even looks like him. This man has worn many hats over the years. He started off as a bureaucrat in the 1970s. He entered Turkey's Ministry of Finance at a junior level, went on to hold top roles in various institutions, retired in 1999 and then entered politics. In fact, the year 2002 was a breakout year for Turkish politics for two people. Kemal Kilic Darolu and Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Kilic Darolu entered the Turkish parliament for the first time in 2002. He was his party's deputy from Istanbul. And Erdogan made a big gain. His party, the Justice and Development Party, AKP, came to power for the first time under his leadership. 20 years on, these two men are facing off in a presidential election. In all these years, Kilic Darolu has tried to project himself as a leader with a difference, one who is not corrupt. But it's not helped beyond a point. The man is 74 years old. He's been leading his party for 13 years, but they haven't won a single election under him. Not yet. Will this year be different? As of today, his chances are limited. Opinion polls say only 40% people are happy with his record as opposition leader, and that's less than the majority he needs in the election. Some of his party colleagues are said to have more favorable ratings, and they stand a better chance at defeating Erdogan. Which is why the nomination as an official candidate, his nomination, came with a fair bit of drama. The alliance was on the verge of a breakup. Some members were not confident about Kilic Darolu's chances. Unfortunately, our views and suggestions were rejected in a resolute way by the stakeholders at the table. I'm sorry to say that as of yesterday, the table of six has lost its ability to reflect the will of the nation in its decisions. But the dissent lasted for barely 72 hours. Concessions were made. The dissenters were told they'll be accommodated as vice presidents if they win the election. And they joined ranks again. Now, as they face the election, what's their USP? What is the opposition's unique selling proposition? They're hoping to capitalize on the anger against Erdogan. And they're promising to restore Turkey's parliamentary system. It was scrapped in 2018, remember, to bring in president's rule. <laughs> We will govern Turkey through consultation and consensus. As the heads of the political parties forming the nation alliance, we have also agreed on the roadmap for the transition to a strengthened parliamentary system. His challenger is Erdogan, and it's not going to be an easy fight. The two men share a long and bitter political history. In 2016, Kilic Darolu was prosecuted for insulting Erdogan. He called the president a dictator. Then he scored a major electoral win against Erdogan. In 2019, he put together a coalition that won big elections in Istanbul and Ankara. It was seen as a big defeat for the president. But the road to, to Turkey's presidency is not going to be an easy one for Kilic Darolu. The biggest stumbling block will be the disinformation law. It was passed last year and it has a provision to arrest citizens who spread misinformation. Erdogan has used this law widely against his critics, including Kilic Darolu. He became the first person to be reportedly charged for slander against Erdogan's AKP party. If convicted, he faces up to three years in jail, which brings us to the million-dollar question. Can this man, Kemal Kilic Darolu, defeat Recep Tayyip Erdogan and end his two-decade-long rule of Turkey? It's, it's expected to go down to the wire. Three months ahead of the election, 
Turkey seems to have no clear favorite.